we'll uh, take all of the specific issues that are arising together with the uh, group discussion. So if our presenters can come and sit up at the top. And uh, we'll start to take, when everyone is seated, we'll take some questions. If you can start to indicate who would like to ask a question. Uh, we'll start off uh, on the side over there. Three, uh, back to three questions, perhaps one, two, and three. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a question about the, the, the yeah, here, uh, Said? Yes, okay. <laughs> the, it, it's a question about the insulin. What, what type of in insulin you were providing to the patients? I mean, it was in, 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 the, in the, the vial, or it was like a pen insulin? What kind of insulin was provided? A vial one. And next, uh, just behind. Yes, thanks. Um, is it working? Florian from um, Institute of Tropical Medicine. A question for Charles, because um, you mentioned that uh, your cargs were quite big and that the interval was three to six months. Um, in other settings, in stable settings, it was like much smaller groups and monthly visits. So in the end, uh, if you have a group of 10 patients and they come monthly or one uh, group member comes monthly, you in the end see a patient at least once a year for the checkup, which would then not be the case in your setting, if I understood it correctly. So, how was the clinical monitoring done in this setting? Thanks. Um, our CAGs haven't yet started coming back, but um, we anticipate that um, groups will be seen once a year and they should be coming in a group. So, once they come to the clinic, a vial load will be taken and drugs will be dispensed. And during that consultation, then they will pick the next person who will be picking the medication in the next six months, if they pick drugs every six months. If they pick every three months, then they will choose uh, members that will be picking the drugs before the next appointment, before the next group appointment, which is once a year. And we had a question further back, and then coming down to the middle after that. Um, thank you. I'm Tina. I'm studying at SOAS, and I've got a question for Bagawi. Bagawi. <laughs> Sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, so if I understood correctly, UNICEF is probably the largest measure of malnutrition in children and women still use the old strap. And I was wondering if you talk to them about your findings at this stage or if you plan to do it. Thank you. Um, Absolutely, we have. We sent them the results of our, our little standardized ASIN exercise. Um, and in fact, we invited them to come today. Um, so it's, uh, but I hope that they're watching. But um, no, they were, they were really positive and really welcoming. They have said they'll show their results to their development unit um, and then take things from there. I, I, we still have to do a, a, a field trial, but I think that the results have sort of raised some issues. And so hence a lot of, of, of agencies have contacted us about this. But UNICEF know, and, and, and they were very welcoming. Kieran? Yeah, thank you. Um, it's a question, uh, it's Kieran, MSF. A question for Said. Um, so I, this is a, a fantastic results and really important work. And I, I just was thinking about the last line when you said this can be used in other MSF and non-MSF settings. And I wanted to ask, so has it now been implemented in the other camps in Dadab, and if so, how did you uh, ensure that they changed their practice, and if not, uh, why do you think they haven't? Yeah, they have not yet uh, enrolled this the same way we did, but they are issuing the patient with uh, just insulin, with no follow-up on the, their blood sugar levels monitoring. They're just given the insulin with their uh, injectable items, so they don't have a clinic for follow-up and uh, these tests of uh, HbA1c. There's no proper follow-up of this patient in the other camps. So some of them opted to move to the Gahli so that they can be enrolled in our clinics. Yes. Hi, um, I'm George from Absolutely Nowhere. Um, <laughs> regarding the strap of malnutrition... Everyone is from somewhere. <laughs> well, um, not related to anything. Um, just out of my own interest. The malnutrition strap, uh, when do... Or how does anyone know when to stop using one side and then start using the other side? So there'll be one day where suddenly you're using 
the child strap, and then the next one, your definition of malnutrition has completely changed? Yeah, so that's, a, that's actually a great question. Um, so the, <laughs> um, the, 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 the basic MUAC strap is, is for children of six months to 59 months. Um, and then we suggest that following that you flip over. The problem is that there are no defined cutoffs in many of these age groups. And you know, the cutoffs we, we were using were based on a consensus from sort of 2013. Things are constantly evolving. Um, the color classes we've used on our oh, sorry the color classes we've used on our strap are, are just for guidance. We're not saying those are the definitive um, cutoffs. We just wanted to prove prove the concept that we had. Um, I leave it to nutrition experts really to to sort of decide on where the cutoffs ought to be, and we can print a new batch. But you're absolutely right that you know we need more consensus on those cutoffs in older age groups. And over on this side. Uh, Daniel O'Brien from the Manson Unit. Um, Charles, thanks for that presentation. That's very interesting. Um, so the advantage of having six months drug, of course, is if there is interruption, you know, they've got much bigger supplies at home, so they don't need to access the clinic as, as often. So that's, that w I'm sure, hopefully will help a lot. Do you still give um, patients a washout pack if they do end up running out of medication to try and stop safely to minimise the risk of um, resistance developing if they have to stop? Um, the washout actually used to be applied to uh, combinations with either AZT or D40, but the current combination of TDF3TC, um, there's no need for washout because TDF itself has a very long half-life. So if it's combined with the favorins and they stop suddenly, at least we have two drugs in the system running. So there's not uh, a risk that uh, the patient would be on monotherapy. And in the center. Thanks, uh, Daryl, uh, anthropology implementer, uh, MSF UK. Charles, can you tell us a bit about the social perception of HIV in the community? Because the gr it seems the groups aren't faced with any stigma because they're large and, and public groups. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. In November, when we were actually planning to start this innovation, basically we were quite concerned about stigma because we started a similar program in Chad, which actually had, uh, it failed because of stigma per se. So we ran a survey, which was uh, uh, an exit survey. And basically, um, from all the locations, we didn't see that stigma was that a major issue. Um, but now that the groups, when we started to implement the actual CAGs, we actually see even the population actually encouraging patients to come in, but also even the actual population is coming in for testing. So that's quite encouraging. Maybe because they hear that MSF is leaving, so that maybe they just want to come and test and then get on treatment and enter CAGs. Uh, but we are yet to investigate that when we run qualitative surveys. While you're thinking about your next questions, I've got a question for Saeed. Um, the experience that Charles has told us about is very interesting from the point of view of the benefits of uh, patient self-help groups or patient support groups. In his case, he was telling us about the benefits for uh, treating people with HIV with <coughs> antiretroviral drugs. Have you uh, helped to set up either formally or informally a patient self-help patient support group for the people with diabetes? Uh, thank you. We have uh, set uh, groups of uh, patients with their age and their sex because these communities are uh, culturally sensitive to uh, mixing with men. So we have a uh, young ladies uh, group, support group, we have children support group and uh, older patient age group, uh, support group. So we meet with them after every two weeks. We have session with them and uh, they talk of uh, their challenges and the experiences and uh, they share what they have seen and uh, s some of the lessons we learn from them is we just keep on the 
having them in groups so that they support one another on the issues of how to overcome a certain challenge. So they share ideas and we have uh, groups for, for them. Thank you. Any remaining questions? Yes? So, thank you so much to all the speakers. Uh, my question is to Said. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation and congratulations for the job because this is something that can change the life of too many people. Uh, my question, you're, you have a very small court and I may wonder if uh, you are going to continue with the study or you have any plans or what's going to what's gonna be next steps? I didn't get your question. Be the next steps of your study for a possible for having more patients enroll or having more uh, more data for more powerful analysis or yeah we have not uh, s completed the study we are, it's just ongoing as you have seen we admitting every new patient who comes and uh, fits the criteria we admit them into the program and. Uh, as long as MSF is still in the camp, I think uh, they will be helped through this uh, program. Thank yeah. you. I think uh, I'll sum up fairly shortly and comment on the, the two characteristics that I picked up during these two days of MSF staff. First of all, the strongly developed humanitarian instinct, and then secondly, the um, inquiring mind, and these are not independent variables. I think these are linked so that as I see it, um, MSF has a commitment, a professional commitment to excellence, which I understand is really providing the best possible care to the populations who you serve, given the difficult situations in which you work. And part of uh, providing uh, excellence, the best possible care under the circumstances, I think really depends on using your inquiring mind to ask questions. You're sitting under the Mapundu tree, you're seeing the problems, you're thinking of the solutions, and then you want to do research to try to figure out how to provide even better care. So I see the humanitarian instinct and the inquiring mind is really going hand in hand. And our three presenters today, I think, have really illustrated that um, uh, joining together of the humanitarian instinct at its best and the inquiring mind at its best. So I'd like to thank you all very much. <laughs> and according to my list of instructions, I only have to encourage the uh, worldwide audience to continue tweeting and to send your comments online. So keep up the barrage of contributions and uh, over and out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dermot, as well. <clears throat>